and yet forever in the same spot mm -hmm. over and over again to get two or three hairs. You're shaking your head no. I see it all the time. No, I'm not saying no. I see I just that's, that's not how I would do it. Man. <laughs> No, 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 I definitely, I just. One thing we always have to do, we always have to make sure our tools are properly sanitized. Hey, let's see it again. We always have to make sure our tools are properly sanitized. And the main reason why is because you want to make sure your tools are able to operate at peak performance. You want to make sure your tools have the ability to actually move at the optimum speed, optimum torque at all consistent times. And the best thing for you to do is make sure you clean your tools right in front of your customers. If you're making sure that you're cleaning your tools right in front of your customers, you're non-verbally communicating that you're sanitary. Mm -hmm. When you actually clean your tools right in front of them, they can't ask the question of, hey, man, listen, I broke out with something back here. And, um, were your clipper, clippers clean? You won't even have to ask that question because you already know that I've sanitized my tools right in front of you. All right, follow? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm going to just do a quick net table. And what I'm going to do is take my tool while it's closed. I'm doing one seat stroke, and what I'm doing is I'm taking my tool, letting it rest on four fingers, and using my thumb as a pivot, dropping two fingers and raising two fingers. That's what we're using to create what we call our C stroke. This is going to be the most often used clipper cutting discipline that every barber is going to have to master. My second time doing a C stroke is I'm going to use it with the tool right here, and I want to do my C stroke slightly higher. The reason why I want to do the C stroke consistently is because the C stroke itself is just going to offer me some of this graduation that I'm looking for. And you can see, because of the C stroke, you will see the graduation already taking place without any car lines being marked into It's primarily because I'm consistent with the C stroke. All right, follow me? My next time I'm doing the C stroke, I'm going to take the tool, I'm going to all the way open. And what I've done here is height, I've raised the position of where our transition is taking place. What's, what would the average barber do next? take a tool up to the nape area and I would just get rid of what you don't need. I would definitely just, so that transition from that one won't look as drastic and it won't look as overwhelming. So you would just have that two to transfer into and then you can just either shear over comb or scissor over comb. Or a clipper over comb or shear over comb, I mean after. Anybody else? Oh shit. Clip over comb. Put on my guard. Put on, most people think we put on guard. The average barber will take it on 116th now. We'll do the same thing. And then probably do it halfway open, do the same thing. Then do all the way open, do the same thing. Take that 116th off and then put a number two on. Same thing. Then halfway open, same thing. I said the average. You mean? You're above average, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're above average. Thanks, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that's what the average barber will do. That's the reason why the 116th and the 118th attached combs are the most often bought attached combs in every different beauty supply store across America because of that very fact. Here's what I'm going to share with you. The inch cover comb. This is your one-eighth guard. My position is, why actually use your guards when you actually just use an attachment comb? Everybody follow me? Mm -hmm. Look, another name for the guards that's being used are attachment combs. I'm attaching my comb with the comb that I already have in my hand. So I'm spending less time because if I already had this comb in my hand, and now I'm starting to use this for clip over comb, I'm saving me from doing this. Hey, <laughs> Mike, you, know, you see my number two? <laughs> it happens in every barbershop across the country. Every barbershop. So my position now was, to take this tool and use it as a guard. Now, there's a few things that I can actually do. I can skip a lot of the steps that guards will actually take me through by using this particular tool as my guard. When I lay this tool flat against the spine, I'm going to get a true 116. Then, depending on the angle in which I angle the comb, I'm going to determine how much hair I can actually dictate that I'm actually going to cut. But my first time using the clip over comb, I want to make sure that the comb is straight. My first time. The reason I want to make sure it's straight is because now I'm lifting the hair, for apples, hair, lifting the hair to a 90 degree angle. So what I'm doing now is a 90 degree cut. What I want to focus on is capturing and releasing the hair that I actually want to have clipped.
and I see the hair that I want to have clipped, I want to make sure my tool is closed. And when I slide the tool across, I'm going to make sure all that hair is being clipped. And now I have a traveling guideline that I can actually match. So I can make sure that the shortest portions of that hair are being clipped to the length that I actually want it to be. And then my next step is going to be using my comb on an angle. The reason why I want to now use my comb on an angle is because the small portions of the hair with the transition I want to keep are remaining the same where the 1 8 was. But now, if I want to go from, say, the number 2 to number 3 to number 4, all within one swipe, I can do so now with the comb on an angle. Some of you may ask the question of what determines the angle in which the comb is actually going to be tilted out to? It's going to be tilted out to the longest length of hair at the occipital bone. That's where I'm tilting out to. If you notice, hair at the occipital bone is being elongated right at this section here. That's going to dictate and determine that angle in which I'm combing out the hair. And that makes sure that I'm marrying together the hair that's right under the occipital bone to the hair that I'm pulling right at the occipital bone to make sure that I'm getting a consistent connection between the two. How many clients have you have had that said, I don't want my hair cut with clippers, I want to cut with shears? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had that? Mm -hmm. cool. Do you understand why they said that? The texture is different? They feel the texture is different? They believe that the, the finish is going to be different? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I don't believe that. I don't believe it either, but I think that's why it is. That's the reason why it is, is because they don't know mm -hmm. that the two can be simulated for, I mean, substituted for each other. This particular tool is what I like to call a mechanical shear. Here's the idea: you have your manual shears, all right? One blade stays stationary, and one blade moves, right? Blade stays stationary and one blade moves. <laughs> Alright, follow? Mm -hmm. What's the biggest difference? I'm powering this. This electric is powering this. How many blade strokes per minute? <laughs> as fast as you can go. <laughs> <laughs> this is a large amount of blade strokes per minute. Now, here's some of the other differences. You may say, okay, we're talking about a standard shear versus a mechanical shear. What about a thinning shear? Or what about a feather razor? Or whether there are some point cutting techniques. How do you actually do that with this particular tool? You remember what I said earlier. The more that you understand about the tool that you have in your hand, the more you'll be able to actually use the tool for what you actually want to use it for. The times that you want to fine tune your transitions, and I don't care whether we're talking about short textured hair or we're talking about longer straighter hair, the concepts still stay the same because here's what we're sharing with you. There's two different types of hair cutting techniques that we're talking about. There's primary cutting techniques and then there's secondary cutting techniques. Primary cutting technique is when you want to make sure that all the lengths of the hair in that particular section are all cut to the same length. Right? Secondary cutting technique is when you want to take that perimeter length or interior length that you created and texturize it just subtly so you can give it a feathered version of that particular look. Or, especially in the interior where you want to exaggerate the versions is when you want to add a large amount of texture in the interior. You might do point cutting, you might do slide cutting, you might do channel cutting, you might even use the razor to unorganize the ends inside the interior to give you a different look. You can achieve the same things, whether it's shorter versions or longer versions, with the mechanical sheet. Here's how we're going to do so. Instead of doing a clip-over comb with the tool closed like we did earlier, we're now going to do the clip-over comb with the tool open. Does anybody understand the reasons why we're going to do it now with the tool open? Get more texture. How are we going to get to more texture? The this is important. Want to that. expand it, the ends will be texturized. How would it get there? Triple zero is like exact. It's very exact when you cut a clipper over comb, but for a reason when you cut with an open guard or a one, whatever you want to call it, it just falls a little bit easier. The lay it layers a little bit nicer. So here's where I'm actually going to show you. And the reason why I, I wasn't trying to question whether you knew what you were talking about, I, knew, I got it. You knew. <clears throat> but here, here's what I want everybody to leave here with. I want everybody to leave here understanding why you're doing everything that you're doing. Because if you don't understand why you're doing everything you're doing, guess what? You're probably doing something that's adding to your garbage time. This whole purpose of this class is figuring out how we can actually reduce the amount of time that we're doing so we can end up increasing what we're actually making, right? When we actually understand more of why we're doing everything we're doing, we have a reason and a purpose for what we're doing, we can actually pinpoint what we need to do, when we need to do, why we need to do it, without sacrificing quality.
and without adding additional time. So the next step I'm gonna do, instead of taking my tool, and this is when I see a lot of barbers, they take the tool and they go. That extra time isn't necessary, right? One thing I like about our tools, they talk to us. Hmm. They let us know when they need a little bit of TLC, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my same clip over comb actions, but instead of pulling the hair out to the ends to determine the length of the interior, what I want to do is expose a little bit more of the weight that I want to have feather on the ends. And while the tool is open, when I slide across, more hair is left behind. And guess what? Some hair is being cut, some hair is not being cut, all because of the tool or the cutting action taking place a little bit further back because of the additional space that the cutter, I mean the comb blade added to it, what we're doing. So if I do it again, I'm going to show you. We do it even at longer sections, longer portions. Hair's left behind, but yet some hair has been cut. So what am I doing? Texture. I'm texturizing the hair. So if I just want to blend more of the hair in smaller sections, I can do so to reduce some of the weight to give it the more of a texture, I mean more of a feather look. So if I have an issue with a heavy weight line, I don't have to move so slow in small control areas to make sure that that pristine look is being created. And right, understand where I'm coming from? What am I saying? The more you understand about what you're doing, why you're doing it, you'll be able to move faster, still more effective and efficient, but without sacrificing quality, either getting more people in and out the chair or, or offering yourself additional time to spend on additional upselling services. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I think that feels like anything, this stuff is making sense to me. Mm -hmm. yes. Perfect. So, we get to that portion. Now we get to the interior of the hair. Section three. I break down every head into three different sections. Every person's head into three different sections. Section one is our lower temple, including our nape. Section two is our upper temple across our ovum. Section three is the top apex crown of the head. I always break down a section of the head to three different sections. I don't care what nationality you are. I don't care what texture your hair is. I don't care how long your hair is. I don't care whether you're male. I don't care whether you're female. Everybody gets broken down. There's a head broken down to three different sections. And here's the reason why. It helps you better process where I have free range to work on your head. Here's what I want to share with you. When we listen to the context clues that our clients are giving us when we're doing our consultation, they'll tell us already which section of the head they will let us have free range with, within the parameters of what they're asking for. But then there's sections of the head that they're more concerned about. And whatever section of the head the client is more worried about, the opposite section is ours. Here's an example. Guy comes in. He says, Ken, listen, I need a low ball fade. I don't want to, I want a ball fade, but I don't want it too high. I want it just like like just a little bit above my ears, but I don't want it too high. I don't want it to come too high. Cool, and take a little bit off the top. What section of the head is he most concerned about? One. Cool. So guess what? I now have to analyze his crown, the top, section three of his head. And I have to determine with what he's asking for. What length and what style is going to complement what he's asking for best? Mm -hmm. So this is mine, and this is his. <laughs> Everybody follow me? Mm -hmm. Lady comes in. She's talking about how long she wants the layers within her. I mean, she wants the length of her hair to be. I want my hair to grow. I'm growing my hair, but my ends are being split. I need you to trim my ends. Cool. Where is the hair coming from that's dictating the section that she's most concerned about? Three. Section one. Oh, section mm -hmm. one. Section one. The layers dictate the term and the, uh, uh, the layers are being created from section three. Uh, so when it comes to the layers, she's going to let you have free range with how short those layers are going to be cut from the interior. Because she's more concerned about the length. She wants her hair to grow. Everyone say that? Mm -hmm. When we understand the language that they're actually sharing with us, it lets us know where we can have free range to do whatever we want within reason in that particular section. Everyone say that? Section two is always what we call a marriage area. It's tying together whatever we did inside of section one to section three. 
But whatever they concern, whatever their concerns are, we have to listen to. Them. We have to listen to. Them. So I'm gonna share with you some other techniques. One of the things I'm gonna tell you, just to be honest with you, I'm not a thousand percent efficient with using manual shears. There are a lot of things that I like to do with my manual shears, but it's not working in section three. My personal reason why I'm not fond of using my manual shears inside of section three is because, especially when I get to the area of the more point cutting, I spend a lot of time trying to slow down and not cut myself. That's just me personally. I'm not saying I can't do it. I'm just saying that I spend a little bit more time versus using my mechanical shears. The other thing I like is, if everybody knows that you're going to get people asking you for more texture inside of section three, why are we spending so much time doing so many subpartings and subsections to create the exact lifts, whether it's, the, whether it's with the old directions or not? Why are we doing so many, so many subpartings and then going back and doing secondary haircutting techniques just to get the texture that we want in the interior? Does anybody know why? It's because the manual shears can only cut a small section at a time. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Here's the other thing. Over direction creates what? Color. Length and texture. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you exactly how. For this particular haircut, I want to make sure that I create a little bit more volume within the fringe because I want to have more room for styling here, but I don't want to have as much hair inside of our right above our oval, I mean right above where our oval and our crown actually meets. So what I want to do is I want to have my tool and I actually outlined this on, did everybody get a handout? Mm -hmm. For those of you that did not get a handout, make sure you pass it, take one and pass it around. So you can actually, this is actually a part of the review. A lot of